Okay, welcome to uh, Sunday Cinematic Service. Um, so as well as The Nun, um, we also watched a different new film, uh, First Reformed, a new Paul Schrader film. A serious film uh, that feels, you know, it, it's it's tawdry to add a Hello Friends, <laughs> Hello Environmental <laughs> Activist on the, <laughs> on the front of this. Um, but yeah, Paul, uh, First Reformed is Paul Schrader's newest and um, possibly final film. You know, he's, he's quite old now and this feels like a culmination of a lot of what he's been trying to do uh, throughout his career. Probably people will see this as the final film, even if it's not, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, it follows Ethan Hawke's uh, priest character, who's sort of the central um, character in the film. Uh, it follows him as... Um, he's a priest of a um, church which is it's not very popular, but it serves as kind of a... Um, it's like a merchandising place. For it's like of historical the, importance. It's of it, historical yeah. importance, and they, they sell sort of T-shirts and get like tourists going to it a lot. Uh, but the actual base of the church is quite small. Um, one of the congruents um, comes to him in a state of sort of um, spiritual uh, decay and upset. He's the reason he's upset is that he's an environmental activist who sees sort of the destruction of the world around him, and he can't take it anymore. And he's thinking of taking sort of drastic actions into his hands. Uh, the film then follows Ethan Hawke as he's, his spiritual de decline is um, contrasted with the environmentalist decline. And it shows sort of how can we have faith sort of now in, in the sort of world that we live in? What is sort of the point of religion in a modern world dominated by sort of corporate interests? And uh, many other sort of deep themes that we'll get into. Uh, so my co-host is Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, Marcus. Uh, so yeah, first off, what did you think of uh, First Reformed? Well, first reformed, uh, I thought was absolutely excellent. Mm -hmm. I I loved ev pretty much everything about the film. It's probably my top films of the year I've seen so far. Um, I was thoroughly impressed by it. It felt like a movie made directly from the nineteen seventies, and I mean that like <laughs> in the nicest way possible. Yeah. Like you know, it it felt like a real vision from yeah. a from a creator who's up until now and certainly like um, not for a very long time has not really been given his due yeah um, you know Paul Schrader is very talented yeah and he can be very talented um, but I often think that he's not being especially recently he's probably not helped himself to be honest but he's not giving himself the best opportunities yeah you know he, he you know he wrote some of the greatest films of all time like Taxi Driver um, Raging, Raging Bull, Bull yeah. Last Temptation of Christ, Last Temptation of Christ, yeah. Um, Directed some amazing ones as well. Blue Collar is really good. Yeah. Mishima, American Gigolo, yeah, all great films. Um, so it was really nice to see him being able to make a film like this and so thematically dense, yeah, as this. Um, no, it it definitely ranks as I say one of one of my favorite films I've seen this year. And what I'm definitely gonna like, you know, rewatch as as soon as I can, basically. Yeah. Um, got some wonderful performances. Ethan Hawke's excellent. Amanda Seyfried's excellent. Um, yeah, pretty much the, the whole the whole ensemble's great. The the, the central conflict. <laughs> Cedric the Entertainer's excellent. Cedric the Entertainer's excellent. You know, <laughs> what, what more could you want? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the, the the overall effect that it creates as well is it. It definitely it definitely does take notes from Taxi Driver. There's even a couple shots which yeah. are basically directly like taxi driver shots. Um, some people might criticise that, being like he's relying on his past glories. Mm. But it's a good structure. And it's, it feels like a modern update rather than a rip-off. Yes. So Taxi Driver is very much a film about the 70s decay. You know, we had yeah. the, the crisis of sort of what was happening in America. It seemed to be in sort of constant decline. Obviously, something no one can relate to today. <laughs> but, like, that was, yeah, it was definitely a 70s version of Decline. This feels like a decline both within America itself and the world as well. Yeah, definitely. Like, this is a film about the destruction of, like, essentially the human race. Yeah, it, it, is, it is an apocalyptic film that has no, like, final apocalypse, if you know what I mean. Mm. Like, I mean, that's kind of the things I really love about it. it. It kind of creates this, like, a really uneasy... And yeah, I, I'm going to use the word again, but a very apocalyptic atmosphere where yeah. it does feel like things are coming to some sort of end, mm. which um, is quite bold, <laughs> like really yeah. bold. Uh, well, it's bold both to be the, of this age and to make a film that feels so final in every way. Yeah. And also, yeah, just one so like, like this is a, you know, a man who's, most people would see past his prime. His last few films were straight to DVD. Yeah. And it sounded terrible and got bad reviews. 
And yeah, he comes out the gate now with something that, you know, he's getting a wide release. People seem to love it. It's got big stars in again, like Ethan Hawke. And it just feels so contemporary. Like, when was the last film you saw so dedicated to, like, you know, climate change and, like, what it means to sort of be alive today? If well, you're, like... well, that's the thing. I, that's the kind of thing that I like about it because, you know, it. the, the thing is with environmentalism in cinema yeah. is a massive topic. And I think it became a bit of a joke. Because in the early 90s, you had yeah. all these films you know, all about saving the rainforest. And in, and I, I think... <laughs> the Postman, wasn't the, that the, one Yeah, yeah, The Postman, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we've got to save the environment. And it became a bit of a joke. Yeah. When, like, the reality is, is that it's far from a joke. Yeah. Um, like, even here in Britain, we've had the hottest summer on record. Yeah. We've, we've just had it. And climate change is... An undeniable fact. <laughs> I know it's not a controversial statement to make, but it is at this point it is undeniable. So first reform does feel very timely, and I appreciate that it does treat that topic seriously because yeah. it is easy to laugh at a film which is like, oh, we're environmentally conscious because you think of like you know Fern Gully or like you know. Like, well, I think most people think of that awful film Into the Wild. Uh, Into the Wild, yeah. Which is about like you know a privileged rich boy who you know. I can't take society, man. So he, he flees into the wilderness to, to, you know, like, to get away. I feel like most films, it's because they take it from the point of view of, like, yeah, how, you know, like, I either like it's, it's a thing that's to do with, like, you know, it's not going to affect us or anything. And, like, they, they try and, like, externalise the problem kind of thing. Like, this feels like how it relates to real people and real lives. and Yeah. And it has a criticism that's so far reaching of, like, the whole of society, like... Like, the, the problem with the church and climate change is that, like, the church is dominated by financial interests who won't let him talk about it. Exactly, yeah. And that's kind of exemplified by the parent church yeah. that basically owns the historical church that Ethan Hawke's character works in. They're, like, this huge centre. It's very modern, you know. Um, you've got all, you know, you've got this guy who does, like, televised things and YouTube videos. Um Basically, yeah, spreading the, the corporate interest of the church. Mm. And yeah, the, the film posits this, this interesting central question of how can you be content in a world that is ultimately almost on the brink of self-destruction? Yeah. How can you find contentment in it? Like, what can you do? Um, and that's the whole crisis of faith at the centre of Ethan Hawke's character. Mm. That, that's what he's all about. Yeah. Um, like you see in the beginning, there's a bit where he tries to console the environmentalist. And it's so obvious that he's, you know, his answers are such a weak sauce to it. Like, there's yeah. just no spiritual way to, like, just the fact the world is dying. Like, you can't, like, excuse that away like he tries to do. Like, it gets really the sort of helplessness, I think, a lot of people who are, like, aware of the issue feel as well. Like... Yeah. And the fact, the fact that, like, there's no sort of mainstream, like, answer to it, really. Like. And that's the thing, because especially at the moment when we have a person in power who does deny climate change. <laughs> thinks it's a Chinese conspiracy. Thinks it's a, yeah, thinks it's a conspiracy theory. Um, you do increasingly feel like you are shouting into the void. Mm. And, you know, people aren't being heard. And it's like the evidence is all around. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, if, I suppose inevitably with first reform, you've got to get into the politics side. Yeah. Inevitably. But, you know, like the, the fact is, you know, like, you know, when you've had Donald Trump leaving, like, Paris treaty yeah. for climate change and you have a person in, in power and importance who is denying climate change um, and not even just that like he's absolutely destroying the um, regulatory system that would actually save the planet exactly like, yeah he's just like letting coal just dom destroy the environment basically yeah, like, yeah. By, uh, by talking about this myth of clean coal and like yeah. well what is we're bringing the jobs back other than like the end of the world really like I mean, he's not obviously going to bring the jobs back anyway but even if he did like that would just be the end really like you, you just want to leave this stuff in the ground and replace it with green energy but yeah yeah because cause at that time the paris tree is at the moment probably the best mm. and most sustainable plan for our... even that's not enough like. it's not enough <laughs> yeah it, it's not it is not enough and that, that is really what first reform grapples with ultimately. Mm. It grapples with how can you um, how can you put your faith in something when the whole world around you is ultimately fucked. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's quite depressing really. 
It is, and, and like the way it's filmed as well. Like, like it's um, we've not mentioned it's in the Academy ratio. Yes, you're a big, you're a big ratio. I, I am a bit infamous mm. when it comes to aspect ratios. I'm, I'm all about them. If, if a film's not presented right, I yeah. get annoyed. Um, and I was because we, we saw this at the Hyde Park Picture House in Leeds. Excellent cinema. Which is excellent, yeah. So if you're in Leeds and you're a cinephile, like it's probably one of the best cinemas in the UK. Um, they projected it in the most gorgeous way. Like mm-hmm. the ratio was perfect, and uh, what that creates is an effect of that you can't escape from it. Like the way it's shot and all those bits, loads of close-up shots, and with, with, with the frame, since the, the edges of the frame are completely cut off, it's basically asking you to directly engage with it. Yeah. There's no looking away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't look to the side of the frame. You can't look to the the right side of the frame. You've got to engage with what's in front of you. Yeah. Uh, it's very very clever in that way because um, obviously what you're seeing is one the self destruction of uh, of Ethan Hawke's character, but then also on on the whole thematic level of there's no escape of what's happening. <laughs> Yeah. There's, there's no way around this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it does the best thing where the actual style is the substance. Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. The way it's done in all close-ups. Uh, like, it feels so claustrophobic for the first, like... Well, we're getting to spoiler territory now. So it feels so claustrophobic for, like, the first hour, maybe, like, hour and 20 minutes. And then it does this beautiful thing where, like... So, um, just at, relatively randomly meets Amanda Seyfried's character... And then they lay on the floor, and he like lays on top. She lays on top of him, is it, or does she lay down? And he lays. Oh no, she's on top of she's him. On top of him like, yeah, yeah, like a lock of her hair falls on his face. Like that's a great image, and yeah, so she must be on top of him. And then they sort of float above the earth, and it goes into this sort of montage of different sort of natural beauty of the world, and then sort of like it comes back to sort of freeways and tr- cars, and like showing sort of what's been lost and. That that is one of the best moments in in a film for like years. I mean, like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the way it breaks that spell of the claustrophobia to sort of just just pull out the film in a way that feels completely natural, just just amazing. Like yeah. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I mean, like I, I have heard some people like if from that point, I have heard people who criticize like the ending. Oh well, do you want to? Uh, yeah, we, we can get into we, the we ending. Get, now. We, 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 yeah. Yeah, we can. We might as well get into that. Yeah, um, but I, I have heard people in general like kind of criticize it. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's perfect. Like, because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, there is a lot of problems going on. You know, there's a lot of unavoidable issues. Yeah. But you got to take solace in what you have. Yeah. You know what I mean? And even Hog finds someone who does genuinely make him happy. Uh, basically, he, uh, even Hog's character, is pushed to a point uh, where he kind of is about to do an act of uh, eco terrorism. Yeah. Um, he is going to blow up uh, the church. Um, because they're having like a big 200 year anniversary um, for the church. It's been 200 years since it's been built and opened. Um, and at the ceremony, at the service, he's gonna he's gonna blow up the whole congregation, uh, Travis Bickle style. You know, killing like, the vested interests that are ruining the church. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but ultimately, um, and it's it's a little it's a little bit like amb- ambigu- uh, ambiguous. 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 Yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say there. I- ambidextrous. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a little bit ambiguous the way that it, the way it was done. But I think ultimately the the takeaway for me was that um, Amanda Seyfried ultimately stops him. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And um, it's it's taking the solace in what even Hawk is able to peruse. You know, like appreciate what you have. Yeah. <laughs> it's his my ultimate takeaway. I think. Um, try and, and form a human connection as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. Here kind of thing. Like yeah, try, yeah. try and find something that makes you happy, because yeah, the world is a world can be quite you know it, it is we're in such destructive and weird times. You've got to try and get out there and find the things that make you happy. So in a way, so it is quite a depressing film, mm. but I suppose in the same way, it's ultimately quite hopeful as well, in a really kind of again unironic way. Yeah. Um, well, it's just it's so yeah freed from irony like. Obviously, now you know today there is a lot of irony, and like, I think as a as a protective shield against the very things this film talks about, climate change, uh, you know, rich interest in like public places, and yeah, like that's an easy shield against it. But like some some it's so un, like like this that's so like unvarnished and unironic, and just yeah, with such a simple message, it it really does sort of like cut through, and like it, it's deeply like moving. I think the end of the film and. Well, just the film overall, just because it is cutting through so much of like, 
it, it feels so relevant to now and it feels like so so timeless as well like obviously the four by three helps and yeah you had a classical I, it almost feels black and white as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like there's very little actual color within the film yeah but yeah just yeah highest recommendations for the film oh yeah completely yeah yeah i mean it, it's probably out of general release now but i imagine it will be long for like a like a home video or streaming release yeah um so yeah no if, if you do get a chance to see it on the big screen it is really recommended it's probably still playing in art house well it was only ever in art house oh, yeah, anyway. yeah. <laughs> but yeah if you're in manchester home they may still have home i have it yeah yeah uh, um london probably definitely still there definitely there yeah 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 uh, but yeah, great film. Anything else to add? It, it just feels so pure, like, within the film. So, like, talking about it, like, there's a lot to discuss, but it also feels like just to just to want to get people to see it kind of thing, if you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, and, and it's for, like, it is for, like, a genuine reason where, like, if you are a cinephile and yeah. you do love cinema, then, you know, the, the kind of the film that Paul Schrader made... It, because I I'd, I'd gone through a bit of a period where like you know the, I I was seeing stuff in the cinema because I I do a blog as well like a review blog yeah I was getting a little bit disenfranchised with it yeah a little bit like ugh, you know <laughs> I gotta see another like I was forcing myself to see films that like I wasn't ultimately bothered about seeing mm. like just because I could yeah, yeah, yeah um first reformed kind of maybe like oh you know what I actually do like <laughs> I actually do like cinema I I, I love it like. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's always nice like, something that comes on every now and then which kind of like reinvigorates your interest. Yeah. And I, I definitely feel that way like with First Reformed. Well, uh, yeah, like how much in the cinema is just like navel-gazing garbage as Exactly, well, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. About someone in, in New York or someone who's, you know, like, oh no, I'm getting divorced and I love this younger woman. And, yeah, yeah. But that's obviously Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> how did you... I, I couldn't have guessed. <laughs> but like just something that feels this like primal alive, like... Yeah. I think it's the best film of... It's quite difficult because in the UK, a lot of the best films in America come out early 28... Like, you know, Phantom Fred and Lady Bird oh, yeah. are probably on the same level as this. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Definitely Phantom Fred. Lady Bird's probably about the same as this, and I think I'd Phantom say Fred's better than both. Yeah, probably, But obviously yeah. they're technically 2017 films, it's technically 2018. Yeah, but I, I, I for, for me, the way I do it is, if a film goes on general release in the UK, yeah. like in the year, that's how I kind of cheat and say, like, well, that's my film of 2018. But yeah, you're right, because they are technically... 2017, 2017 ones, films, yeah. yeah. But for me, for us, we could only legally see them <laughs> yeah. in 2018. So, yeah, they go on my list. But yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. For, I mean, to be honest, in general, this year, I just think, as, I mean, we might as well, because we mentioned Phantom Fred and Lady Bird. I do think, in general, there has been some. Because, you know, I, get all the, I think a lot of the prestige films that come out, I think maybe you watch once. Yeah. And you kind of don't come back to them, but I feel like I've definitely rewatched Phantom Fred because I loved it. I'm on and, the uh, fifth watch now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've only seen it once in the cinema, you know, and. Um, and Beautiful. He, yeah, I, I, lo- I loved it. You know, about, yeah, the more I thought about it, that probably is probably my number one film from this year. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Phantom Fred, I loved. Lady Bird, I loved. I definitely watched Lady Bird again, and well, I would definitely watch First Reformed again. Yeah. So. Yeah, good, good on, good on you, good on you, Phil. Good on you, Paul Schrader. Good on you, Paul Schrader. Yeah. Reinvigorating Chris's love of film. <laughs> and like when it's for, for like you know it's like a godsend in this film as well. Like ironically, ironically, yeah, yeah. Subject matter, but like um, like you know like you just watch films at this time of year and they're just such garbage. They're yeah. just Marvel films and like you know just like just big budget crap. The sequels and stuff for something like this to come out at this time during summer is yeah it's it just yeah makes you feel good about film again it's a nice solace definitely yeah yeah, yeah. um so yeah no I, I loved it if you get a chance to see it um yeah highly recommended yeah check out first reformed <laughs>